Now, for the snooker situation, from what I understand, it was your investigation into it that actually led to him actually being brought into court for for the case and the case being reopened. Could you go into the history of how you became interested into this case and some of the research that you've done in it? Yeah, sure. Uh, the, what gripes me about Dark Side of the Ring is that uh, at a very basic level, at least, I believe, nobody can watch that thing and not come away concluding that Jimmy Snuka is responsible for Nancy Argentino's death, period, end of paragraph. That's a good thing for a documentary that's largely pitched at a wrestling fan audience. At least they did that. It grinds me, though, and some of it is vanity because much too much credit, I feel, went to the Allentown Morning Call and not enough to my work. So some of it is vanity, but some of it is more than vanity. It's substance because by accepting the orange, the uh, Allentown Morning Call spin on what happened, I think Dark Side of the Ring missed what is the real takeaway in the year 2020, which is that Snuka got away with it, and he got away with it because of corruption in the criminal justice system in Lehigh County, Pennsylvania. And most of the players who let him off the hook in 1983 are still there, including the corrupt district attorney, James Martin, who was the assistant district attorney in 1983, a fact that the Allentown Morning Call and its celebrated 2013 so-called cold case package uh, failed to share with their readers. All right, enough of that speech and to go back to how I got involved in it. In 1992, uh, the Village Voice, uh, the, the alternative weekly in New York, uh, assigned me to do a big cover story on the scandals in then WWF at the time. And those scandals were the ring boy sex abuse, uh, some more on the Dr. George Zahorian steroid trial, which had happened the year earlier in, in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, which isn't that far from Allentown. And they sent me to Allentown, and I did research on a number of things. But the biggest thing I was doing in Allentown wasn't even the central piece of the Village Voice story, but what we call in journalism a sidebar. I was going to do a side story about this town secret of Jimmy Snuka and his girlfriend and the death at the George Washington Motor Lodge in Whitehall, Pennsylvania, right outside Allentown in May of 1983, when Snuka was there with his girlfriend for the uh, WWF uh, television tapings, the syndicated television tapings, which they did there every three weeks. And this was at the height of his popularity. So the reason I, I wound up uh, running into problems with my editors is the Village Voice, which is kind of the story of my career, which is why I'm this uh, shotgun freelancer who uh, now has a website and, and publishes books off what I investigate as often as I can. But don't, but don't have a platform of a major media, you know, newspaper or magazine. Uh, I never was able to get the Village Voice to get off their duffs and publish my big story about WWE. But they had edited and were satisfied with this sidebar on Snuka, which isn't that long. It's, it's over a thousand words, but it's under 2,000 words. I obviously could have written a voluminously long article, but it was assigned as a sidebar. And so it's very succinct. And uh, so I, I go to Allentown in 1992, and the first person I saw was the coroner, Wayne Snyder. He had been the deputy coroner in 1983. I walked into his office. I introduced myself. I said, I'm doing something about a wrestler. And he immediately lit up. He said, oh, you're writing about that super fly guy. Started waving his arms around. And he says, I've always wanted to get that guy. And he said, write, write this down. Here's what I'll say. Upon viewing the body and consulting with the forensic pathologist, 
I immediately suspected foul play and so notified the district attorney. Now, as far as I'm concerned, that's in my article that didn't get published by the Village Voice. I published it myself later in the 1990s at a website I had with compiling all of my magazine articles, published and unpublished. And then it became a chapter of my 2007 book, Wrestling Babylon. If you look at that, what, what the coroner said to me on the record, I immediately suspected foul play and so notified the district attorney. And it was because he had viewed the body and talked to the forensic pathologist. It is a roadmap to the any investigation that was ever done subsequent to that. So I give all the credit to the two Morningtown, uh, downtown morning call reporters who in 2013 at the 30th anniversary had the enterprise to go into uh, the archives of the federal district court in Philadelphia, where they had the records of the Argentino family's civil lawsuit against Snuka, and they, they dug out some records that the cops were withholding for many, many years, and they published them, and they published a story off it. Good on them for that. But there was nothing fundamental about the story that was not known in 1983 by the morning call, and certainly was not known by them after 1992, when I was in Allentown, so I saw the I saw the uh, uh, the, the coroner, I saw Detective Gerald Procannon of the Whitehall Township Police, who told me a ridiculous stream of lies. Ridiculous, not just because they were lies, but because they were so easy to disprove within uh, hours, within minutes. He said Snooker had told only one story that Nancy had uh, uh, fallen when they stopped by the side of the road driving into town for her to uh, go to the bathroom. And she had slipped and hit her head and they thought nothing of it. And later she was, he realized she was stricken and it was too late. She was dead. Pro said that was the only story that he told. He told, depending on how you count, between four and a half and six different versions of what happened. He told the uh, the chaplain and the orderlies and the nurses at the hospital different things about uh, a physicality, either horseplay that got out of hand or a lover's quarrel. Um, uh, and Pro Cannon also said to me in 1992 that the Argentino family uh, was not dissatisfied with their investigation. He never heard from them at all except for a perfunctory communications over uh, settling some expenses related to the uh, funeral bill. And I then talked to the Argentino family uh, and found out that that was a complete lie. In fact, the Argentino family had commissioned two different private investigations. I write about this uh, in the original article, and I write about it in greater depth in the uh, 2013 ebook that I did with uh, uh, Louise and Lorraine, Nancy's sister, which is called Justice Denied, uh, the uh, untold story of Nancy Argentino's death in Jimmy Superfly Snooka's uh, motel room. Uh, Louise and Lorraine told me that uh, about these private investigations, they sent me the documentation of it. But also they told me that in 1985, the family sued Snooka in federal district court in Philadelphia in a civil case for wrongful death. Snooker never showed up. The family won a $500,000 default judgment of which Snooker never paid a dime. He claimed bankruptcy. He didn't pay his lawyers who withdrew from the case. So for, for, for Detective Procannon to have told me what he told me knowing that I would immediately uh, disprove what he said was extremely arrogant or stupid or something. I don't know. So that's another thing that happened in Allentown in 92. Yet another thing that happened in Allentown in 92 is that I met with a group of reporters and editors from the Allentown Morning Call. Uh, we met in a conference room. We were talking at one point about partnering up on the story with the Village Voice, maybe. They decided that they didn't want to do that. But the point is, I told them about my research, 
and I, I vividly remember that the reporter who did the first day story for the morning call in 1983, a reporter named Tim Blanger, said that Detective Procannon, the day he was reporting it, had had speculatively reenacted what the police thought was the uh, was the prevailing theory of what had happened, which was Jimmy grabbing Nancy by the shoulders and uh, probably pushing her against the wall, maybe more forcefully than he intended. And she hit her head on the wall or on a blunt object. And that's what probably happened. And it aligns with the story that Louise, Nancy's sister, told me about a time in their in the family house in uh, in Brooklyn when Snooka was there and she was alone in the room. She, Louise, was alone in the room with Snooka. And he did something fairly similar where he put his uh, his hand around her throat and 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 forced her up against the wall and whispered to her, you know, I could choke you and no one would ever know. Just to terrorize the hell out of her. And Louise said that uh, she talked to other former partners of Snooka's and subsequent partners, and he had a thing about pushing women up against a wall. So again, the point of all what I'm saying here is that in 92, I didn't have all the details, I didn't have all the I's dotted, all the T's crossed, but we certainly had knew enough to know that there's this serious problem with the amount of circumstantial evidence that was gathered at the very time of the incident and knowledge of Snooka's contradictory kaleidoscopic accounts of what happened, enough to say, why wasn't this guy hauled before a jury of his peers and tried for third degree murder and manslaughter? And that was the story then, it was the story later, and it's the story now that I believe The Morning Call still hasn't told. And the, and the dark side of the ring still hasn't completely told in the round by having this orientation of saying, Jimmy Snuka, the complicated legacy of a superstar, he entertained the masses by jumping off steel cages and on the side he had this little problem, he probably murdered a 23 year old woman. Well, that's not what that, that doesn't satisfy me in the year 2020. What we need to be talking about is where, what happened with these prosecutors, what happened to the corrupt criminal justice system in Lehigh County, Pennsylvania. And for the civil lawsuit that he never paid, similar to the one in, I have with Abdullah the Butcher that he's been running away from paying. Um, what I don't understand is he went on to have about a three or four year career with WWE from, I think, around 89 to 93. Why didn't they try and collect at that point? Because he was in two WrestleManias. He would have been making some pretty good cash in those years. Yeah, it makes no sense how, how he was able to to slip away. I think I think the uh, Argentino family, uh, and it is a working class family in Brooklyn, uh, they probably, I mean, I don't know if their lawyer walked away because he was handling the case on a contingency and he expected to get some money on the back end and uh, maybe he didn't advise them well enough or they got demoralized and they gave up. I don't, I don't know exactly what happened, but yeah, the, how, how does this guy like uh, not pay a dime? Not only not pay $500,000, but not pay anything. Uh, from then until the day he died. It's, it's bizarre. Because he was headlining shows against the Honky Tonk Man, too, on the house show loop. So he would have probably been making some of those years in the hundreds of thousands. I, I could only imagine because those, those, those were still the peak years of WWE. Yeah. Well, he was a, I mean, he was a mess and his finances were a mess. He had back taxes. He had a lot of stuff going on. So I don't, you know, I'm no like expert on, accounting and who's senior debtor and how you know, how you get away with not paying a half a million dollar judgment but all i can tell you is he didn't pay a half a million dollar judgment and he got away with it and i guess the big thing about this dark side of the ring documentary the kind of 
so-called new evidence that came out was Tonga Kid alleging that he was in the car with Snooka and Nancy on the way to Allentown. But I understand that upon further research, it doesn't appear that Tonga Kid was even on that show. Well, I just did a piece at my site, and I, I, I actually disagree with that a little bit. I think that, I think that the the uh, the Tonga Kid testimony in Dark Side of the Ring is is the best part of that episode. It's certainly the piece of brand new evidence, a brand new angle to the case that nobody knew about. I didn't know about, and uh, I was uh, I was doing an interview with a, an Irish podcast called Off the Ball on Wednesday, the day after the Dark Side was airing, and I was saying these things. And one of the hosts, uh, uh, Richie McCormick, stopped me and he said, you know, Dave Meltzer just tweeted that uh, that uh, Sammy Fatu was not booked on that set of shows in Allentown. And, and my reaction to that was, well, you know, Dave Meltzer is, knows a lot, so maybe I better walk this back a little bit. But when you closely examine what Meltzer said, I don't think it disqualifies Sammy Fatu's statements at all because Sammy Fatu's first he he was a as he says in Dark Side of the Ring he was a he was a troublemaker he had he had problems with the law as a juvenile in San Francisco his mom ships him off to Pennsylvania to train as a pro wrestler under her brothers Sammy's uncles Alpha and Sika the Wild Samoans so he's there. He's a teenager. His first uh, show is a house show in Connecticut on May 2nd, 2000, uh, 1983, excuse me, May 2nd, 1983, which is a little more than a week before the Snook and Nancy incident. And he's not on the shows in Allentown. But that doesn't mean that he's not hanging around. Snook is kind of his mentor. He's a fellow Pacific Islander. He's taking him under his wing. Maybe he's driving into Allentown with Nancy and Snooka. That's what he said. It's pretty clear in the post Dark Side of the Ring interviews that by the uh, producers, uh, 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 Jason and uh, and uh, Evan, that uh, that they didn't ambush uh, Fatu. They got him to clearly contextualize this. They made sure he knew he, he knew what he was saying. He may not have known the implications of what he was saying in terms of Snooker's alibi, but he was very clear that it was that May 10th taping that he was driving in with, with, uh, with Jimmy and Nancy and that there was no incident of stopping by the side of the road to pee. I think that's very important. I don't think it's a slam dunk. He's a, he's a retired pro wrestler. He could be confused or he could be BSing or trying to get into the spotlight again or something. That is possible. But I don't think just because he wasn't booked on those shows uh, invalidates what he said. He clearly was part of the WWE troop or family or at least a hanger on. He was starting to get prelim uh, bookings. He was training. I don't see any reason to disbelieve that he was driving in in the car with Nancy and and Jimmy if that's what he says. And, it, and if it's true, then wow, that's 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 another nail in the coffin in terms of Snooka's ridiculous story. Now, uh, on the dark side of the ring, immediately after Sammy Fatu, they have on the retired police chief of Whitehall Township, Frederick Conjur who makes a complete idiot out of himself, first of all, because he says, well, just because Snook had told a bunch of different stories, it doesn't mean that we can do anything about it. I mean, it's kind of criminology 101 that when you have a, a circumstantial case with compelling evidence, the fact that the only suspect uh, can't keep a story straight has uh, uh, got to make you go more aggressively toward finding things out, not just dropping it. So he's he, he comes off like a fool, uh, Chief Conjur. But significantly, and it turns out that the in real time, the interview with Conjur was immediately after the interview with Fatu. Uh, the Dark Side of the Ring uh, interviewers 
ask him about a story of a third person in the car with Jimmy and Nancy. And, and Conjur says, yeah, I might have heard something, a little bit something about that, which is like, an, another, like, why wasn't it in the reports at the time? The conduct of the police is just unconscionably incompetent at best, but I think much more than that, uh, corrupt. Because even if you accept Snooka's story, why didn't they drive him around to find the exact location where this supposedly happened? They never did that. They did, however, uh, uh, Detective Procannon and another Whitehall officer did go to the trouble of driving 100 miles to the Argentino family's home in Flatbush, Brooklyn, to say, we don't think we've got anything here. And, you know, maybe Nancy had a congenital condition that made her susceptible if she had a little bump on the head for it to get really bad and it, for it to kill her. They didn't present any clinical or scientific evidence to back that up. They just kind of blew off the family. So just on so many levels, everything that the cops and the prosecutors said in Pennsylvania at the time, and I think to this day, is just ridiculous and should be the real focus of public attention. Because there was more marks on her, too, than just the bump on the head, from what I understand, and also... Wasn't there a history of abuse between those two from just a week or two earlier? Absolutely. Just two months earlier, there was a, uh, a domestic violence incident at a motel just outside of Syracuse, New York, that actually in the wrestling community got a lot more attention at the time than Nancy's death itself of a couple of months later. It was covered by the mainstream media because it was such a wacky scene with Snooka dragging Nancy down the hallway of this Howard Johnson's, both of them naked. He was dragging her by the hair. It took, I forget how many cops and police dogs to subdue Snooka, who ultimately pleaded down to a, a minor charge and made a donation to the local Ronald McDonald house and things just carried on. So there's a history of domestic violence in the Snooka-Nancy uh, relationship. There later was domestic violence in the uh, in Snooka's home with his uh, his wife at the time, who were living just down the block on Coles Mill Road in Haddonfield, New Jersey, from Buddy Rogers. The wives were good friends. Uh, Buddy Rogers told me in 1992 that uh, Jimmy was a sweet guy, but when he was on junk, cocaine especially, but other drugs as well, that he was a totally out of control, and that he used to beat the shit out of his wife. So we have we have the domestic violence, we have the history of domestic violence with Nancy and Snooka, and we have the markings on, on Nancy's body when she died, not just the crack in her head, but uh, bruises and signs of trauma throughout her body, which uh, were, as the forensic pathologist said, consistent with made abuse. So what the hell's going on here? Was that wife the same wife that appeared in the Dark Side of the Ring episode that was beaten uh, and supposedly complained to Buddy Rogers? No, Carol, Carol Snooker, the widow who's in the Dark Side of the Ring episode was his last wife. And I'm blanking on the name of his wife at the time in the Carolinas and then in New Jersey and mother of, uh, of uh, at least some of his children. It's a different okay. woman. So this was basic. Nancy was basically his mistress. He was married. He had two lives at the time, right? Yeah, he was. He was a bigamist. Uh, it's not clear whether Nancy uh, knew about his wife, or if she knew about it. And the way women sometimes can be in these situations had confidence that he was separated, had one foot out the door, and she was his fiance. Or uh, we we're, we don't we don't really know, but yeah, he was living two lives: one at home, one on the road. And on the road, Nancy was not just his girlfriend, but was had kind of taken over the Buddy Rogers role of being the person who drove him to his bookings and got him to the church on time, because Buddy Rogers by then was washing his hands of Snooka because. He was worried that you know Snooker was snorting cocaine in the car while they were driving, and 
Rogers was worried that he was going to get into serious trouble if he was in the, in, in the wrong place at the wrong time with Snuka. So Nancy and her sisters say kind of had a job too. She was his, she was Snuka's handler. She got him where he needed to go. He didn't have a driver's license. She did. And she, she drove him places. Now I interviewed Rocky Johnson about this and he was friends with Snuka, but he even displayed suspicion in my interview with him. But he mentioned to me that at the time all that happened, Snuka actually could have been bigger than Hulk Hogan. So for people that that only remember Snuka in the 90s, I guess at that time he was really a massive superstar in the business, which might be why things would have been covered up a little bit. Completely why. And Snuka was, these are the last years of the old territorial system. Hogan comes to WWF in November or December of 1983, gets an immediate mega push, becomes champion, and the whole Hulkamania, WrestleMania cycle is underway. But prior to Hogan, and even while Bob Backlund was the titular champion of WWF, Snuka was the biggest star. He was box office gold. I mean, he came up from the Carolinas in 79. He was, he was so over. He had the uh, he had freakish athleticism. Uh, nobody sculpted like him, with as thickly muscled as him, had ever been a flyer like he was. And and after he did this the steel cage splash onto Backlund at the Garden, the reaction was so intense that uh, Vince McMahon Sr., Vincent James McMahon. Vincent Kennedy McMahon's father, who was then running things, realized that they were going to have to flip him from a heel to a baby face because he was so popular. And that started the whole angle with uh, his breakup with Lou Albano. Buddy Rogers brought in as his uh, protector and baby face manager. And he was, he was on fire. And at the time of the Nancy Argentino death, he was at his absolute zenith in the middle of his program with don morocco which culminated the the death of nancy was may of 83 i want to say october of 83 was the show at the garden in which uh uh uh, uh morocco won a controversial cage match but snooka splashed him from the top of the cage and left him laying at the end of everything and uh he was he was uh, he was the superstar of superstars at that at that moment in WWF history. What was the fallout he had with McMahon in in '85 that made him leave the company for a period of time? Well, I don't know, but he was you know he was becoming increasingly unreliable. I'm uh, speaking of Sammy Fatu, the Tonga kid. I mean, he started out as Samoan number four. But in, in, when, in 84, Snuka did the angle with Roddy Piper on Piper's pit where Piper taunts him, hits him over the head with a coconut, causing him to collapse and knock over the whole set of Piper's pit. And Piper beats him down. And, and then you know, Jimmy comes to his senses and runs after Piper, but Piper's already made it to the locked door of the dressing room or however the hell they did that angle. Anyway, that was a... That was a really hot angle, and led to a lot, led to uh, main events of a uh, Snuka and Piper. But by that point, Snuka was uh, was becoming so unreliable about making his shows that they sent him to rehab. I don't know for how long, and that that's where Sammy Fatu comes in actually because he's he he gets he's a teenager. But he gets this mega push out of nowhere is Jimmy Snuka's cousin from Tonga, the Tonga kid, and actually comport, uh, performs pretty well in a, in, a, in, a, in a tough spot with very little experience. I remember there was a Washington, D.C. Uh, TV news sports anchor named George Michael who had a syndicated show called the George Michael Sports Machine. And he did a feature on the Tonga Kid. I mean, he was, George Michael was a big mark for the Tonga Kid. Anyway, the point is, uh, uh, 
Sammy Fudd, too, the Tonga kid was like the Jimmy Snook uh, surrogate, Superfly 2.0 for that feud while Jimmy was uh, in rehab and indisposed. So that's one of the things that happened to Snooka in terms of his relationship with WWF, his unreliability. He is in the first WrestleMania, but in a kind of ringside seconding role. He's not performing in the ring. I don't know all the exact chronology, but somehow along the way he goes down the pecking order. He winds up leaving WWF and going to the AWA. He then goes to the indie circuit. I know he has another run in WWE later, but uh, but uh, he's uh, you know he's in his forties at that point, and he's probably you know burning out. Um, but that yeah, exactly exactly what caused the the split with uh, WWF the first time. I don't I don't really know, but. But uh, he, he was losing his edge. And one thing that wasn't covered really in the dark side of the ring, but Tony Atlas mentioned it in an interview with me, as well as his book, is that I guess Johnny Rods was allegedly the drug dealer to a lot of the guys in those days. His girlfriend at the time was friends with Nancy. That girlfriend, I guess, was considered a bit of a groupie. She ended up marrying Tony Atlas. But Tony has alleged that at one point the two women were in the room together and that girl could have been a witness. I know Dark Side of the Ring said they tried to find that girl but couldn't. They, we don't know if she's still alive or not. But have you done any investigation into that part of it at all? Yeah, like Dark Side of the Ring, I've tried but did not succeed in reaching this woman and actually others too, like a, a subsequent uh, a partner of his in, in the Pacific Northwest uh, sort of cryptically communicated with the sisters later and said, Jimmy told him, told her what had happened. I had not, not anything I could corroborate and not anything that I published, but yeah, there does seem, that does seem to be in the ozone somewhere. Now the 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 Johnny Rod's uh, uh, fiance. I don't know if they got married. The Johnny Rod's girlfriend was like an old friend of of Nancy Argentino's from Brooklyn, and was the reason she got backstage at Madison Square Garden and started meeting wrestlers in the early '80s. She actually dated Hulk Hogan for a while before she dated Jimmy Snuka. Uh, which is something that not a lot of people know. And uh, I think Hulk was a perfect gentleman in contrast to, to Snooka. Um, one, one thing that I really regret about all this stuff that I've written uh, starting in 1992 was like my first headline over the story was Superfly Snooka and the Death of a Groupie. And uh, no matter how good or bad uh, Nancy Argentino's uh, judgment was and her choices in men, uh, no one deserves to die for it. And uh, I really wish I hadn't used that word groupie, which is kind of a loaded word that re-victimizes victims. Um, so anyway, she, she, was, she, she was a good friend of Johnny Rods' girlfriend. That's how she got into meeting wrestlers. And uh, yes, I've heard the Tony Atlas story too. I don't know if it's true or not, but if, uh, if you held a gun to my head, I'd say it probably is true, but I, I can't write because I can't prove it. And in those days, yeah, we don't want to call them groupies, but there was a group of girls in all the territories that, as I've found out in all the interviews I've done, they would actually rotate around with all the wrestlers and maybe sometime the wrestler would develop a particular affection and they'd be with them for a while, but it seemed like it wasn't uncommon for, for some of those girls to be with multiple wrestlers. So that, that makes sense to me, I guess. Yeah, that happens. And it's not unique to wrestling too, obviously. The other, other walks of, uh, of, of, of entertainment were uh, performers who were celebrities or minor celebrities, semi-celebrities. Uh, uh, there, 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 are, there are women and men who attach themselves to them and and to some extent low paid performers on the road who are trying to get energized to you know 
to uh, uh, give their all for their, their fans day after day after day, come to think of that sort of attention as a perk of their job. So do you think if there was a cover-up, it had more to do with a payoff being made because the company wanted to protect Snuka, or was it a case that WWE was coming to Allentown every three weeks, it was good for the economy, that the town kind of just wanted to protect themselves a little bit and not stir up any trouble that would possibly prevent WWE from, from doing these regular shows there? So you've said two different things, a bribe or a general uh, influence, independence. My, I'm in the camp 100% the second one. The WWE was the circus that came to town every few weeks. They hired off-duty cops for their security. They, everybody, all the wrestlers uh, hung out at certain spots that did big business. There was revenue and uh, you know tax receipts from tickets from their shows, and they were a big deal in that corner of Pennsylvania. Uh, and, and, and it's the reason that I discount the story that first got currency in Snooka's autobiography in 2012, where he vaguely you know, hints at uh, Vince McMahon walking into the climactic meeting with the uh, uh, district attorney carrying a briefcase. And so wrestling fans, being the way they are, immediately extrapolated from that that the briefcase was full of cash and that the cash was a bribe that got distributed to the uh, decision makers, and that's how stuff got off. Look, that may be what happened, uh, but uh, why would Snooka say that? I mean, his book was ghostwritten. I don't think he wrote a book or maybe even knew what his book said. If you look at, at Snooka's interview supporting the book, late 2012 and 2013, you see that he's totally at the mercy of his handlers when he's asked a question they, he sort of answers it however how how they feed him so i don't really think you know he, he may not even have known what was in his own book but to the extent that he did it may be a guilty conscience it's some like every criminal at some level wants to confess and maybe he was doing that i think it's likelier that his ghostwriters inserted that in what i call what alfred hitchcock used to call a MacGuffin. It's a kind of a nonsensical, non sequitur, irrelevant plot twist that just kind of throws everybody off for a while. Uh, and it had the added value of being sensational and, and gossip friendly and may have, you know, helped the commerce and the sales of Snooka's book when this anecdote got around. That's my theory, but I'm not, I'm not sticking to it come hell or high water. I just don't think that Vince McMahon uh, had to bribe anybody in Lehigh County, Pennsylvania. I think he was a big deal. And I think that uh, the more I've learned about the way things work in Lehigh County, uh, the more I know that this is like very much in line with the cronyism and corruption of how things happen there. Thank you for watching the Hannibal TV. Please like this video if you enjoyed it and click the subscribe button to not miss any of our latest shoot interviews match videos, or news updates. Support us on Patreon.com for $1.99 a month to watch our full shoot interviews ad-free and help our channel grow. Follow us on Twitter at The Hannibal TV for instant updates.